Okay, I'm back. I don't, I don't, don't quite know what happened there. Anyway, uh, this is this is uh, a talk about Phytophthora cinnamoma in New South Wales. Can you see that? Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, all right. I have no idea what's going on, but anyway, I'll keep going. Um, so, Phytophthora cinnamoma in New South Wales is very different to how it behaves in Western. Australia, you don't get um, disease fronts. It often picks off uh, plant by plant rather than having uh, mass uh, areas of dieback. And for that reason, uh, people for a long time thought it was native and, um, and really didn't do very much about it at all. Uh, but it does, it does like to eat xanthoreas and it does uh, affect the habitat of some uh, threaten small mammals like the smoky mouse and there are one or two species that are sort of at risk of extinction from it. So the uh, infection by Phytophthora cinnamoma is listed as a key threatening process here which requires us to do something under legislation. Uh, the program for doing that is called Saving Our Species and they generously gave us some money a few years ago, uh, three years of funding uh, to do four things, uh, was model and map the risk uh, from Phytophthora cinnamoma in New South Wales, which is what this talks about. Um, <clears throat> also, we're evaluating some of the current hygiene approaches, which is the fun part of the project, and uh, that'll be finished in November and uh, I'm sure people will be kind of interested in uh, in that because uh, it's really been not what we expected. Uh, we're also testing a, a range of threatened species for susceptibility and uh, the very susceptible ones we're testing for uh, phosphite um, use. So uh, the <clears throat> Uh, creating creating models for uh, for Phytophthora in New South Wales, uh, as anywhere else, um, is really just about um, matching up uh, occurrence data with uh, predictors, and um, you know you come up with some nice um, nice maps. And uh, the idea of risk here is just about uh, the uh, the intersection between something that affects something else. So in this case, uh, Phytophthora cinnamoma affecting things that are affected by Phytophthora cinnamoma. So hasn't been a lot of work done on Phytophthora in New South Wales, but there's been done lots of modeling work done um, at all sorts of scales and using different approaches. Um, but uh, the one that I'll talk about today is, is modelling all of New South Wales. So for those not familiar with New South Wales, it's basically got a gradient of temperature and um, rainfall from hot and dry in the, in the west to cooler and damper in the, in the east, in the coastal areas and the, and the ranges. And to start off with, we had uh, about 5,000 records of, of uh, tests for Phytophthora cinnamoma from around the state, about 1,000 presence records and about 4,000 absence records. And you can see that the Sydney area in the middle there has been sampled to death and, and just about nothing else had been sampled. So the first part of this project was to fill in some of the gaps and uh, we took an additional 457 samples from as many parts of the states um, as possible. And, uh, and then really uh, the main part of the project is really gathering the data, um, getting it ready to use, uh, but also um, yeah, choosing modeling approaches, finding um, predictive variables that can be used and making sure that the, the data is, is fit for purpose. And uh, so, so there's an amazing amount of um, spatial data available now. We had data for climate and soils and geology and 
elevation and aspect and uh, a whole bunch of other things. And some of those things are highly correlated, so they can be sort of cut out. Um, but probably the most important thing was to reduce sample bias. Um, just in pre preliminary models, just looking at the, <clears throat> just mapping sort of suitable habitat, the, uh, on the left-hand side, the red areas are suitable habitat maps just using the raw data. Um, so it gives a very different picture if you try to reduce the spatial bias um, on the right, which is just subsampling from uh, one, one sample per 100 square kilometre um, grid. So running this through a, a software program called Maxent, which just uses presence records and we use that partly because for some of the area we didn't have absence records and also for an introduced species like this um, there's a risk that if you use a presence and absence model that some of the absences that you're recording are just because um, the thing hasn't quite arrived or been detected in sampling. So our model, the, basically the, the white area is, is uh, uh, an area that we don't have any samples in. So it's the arid zone uh, area below 450 millimetres. But the red area shows uh, the, the coast and um, some of the sandstone areas, particularly around Sydney, are the most suitable at the moment for uh, Phytophthora cinnamomai. And model validation was, uh, was very good using this approach. So the best predictors um, uh, for the distribution were temperature annual range, uh, maximum temperature of the warmest month, so months between 21 degrees and 29 degrees were highly suitable for Phytophthora cinnamomai, and the more rainfall the better. Now there's uh, a whole lot of uh, data out there on uh, predicting climate into the future. And uh, we used uh, an average of three models that have been found to be quite, um, quite good for New South Wales. And so we modeled the distribution in 2070 and then compared that model with the current suitability model Model. So in this uh, map, the red areas are basically areas that are going to become more suitable for Phytophthora cinnamomai, and the blue areas are um, areas that are likely to become less suitable for Phytophthora cinnamomai. So it seems to be moving um, up in elevation um, and south, um, so becoming less suitable in the north. Now, uh, modelling risk or working out what sort of assets, um, uh, things that are affected by Phytophthora cinnamomai, there's vast numbers of things that could be affected, including tourism or... Um, anyway, we, we chose to use uh, threatened species because they're already covered in um, legislation. Uh, they're already regarded as being at risk for other reasons. And uh, we, for some of them, we knew something about whether they're susceptible or not. So we again modelled basically where threatened species are likely to occur, and that model was weighted by their likely susceptibility. And uh, so this is the model that uh, comes out of that. Um, and you can see that it, in some ways, that it uh, it reflects the. Um, uh, the, the habitat suitability for Phytophthora and in some ways that's kind of not surprising because we don't know anything about the susceptibility of arid species for instance and uh, there are also more threatened species records in the in the east than in the west but anyway that's uh, that's what we came up with for with that so if you combine the, the, the habitat suitability model for Phytophthora cinnamomai and multiply it by the uh, distribution of the assets, the threatened species, uh, you come up with a, a risk model. And um, so basically, again, it shows that the, the greatest risk is on the, uh, on the coastline and the hinterland and the, the tablelands adjoining that. 
and um, uh, so th these maps will be used not so much to drill down to the the resolution of the um, uh, the grid cells, which is one kilometre square, but just to to look at particular areas, maybe national parks, and and work out which parts of the park uh, you know are at risk and which which are not, um, which parks to focus on, uh, which which threatened species to focus on, for instance. And again, we can we can project some of this into the future to look at uh, how this is going to change. And risk seems to be even more sort of uh, focused in the future that um, it really is going to be on the, the southern Blue Mountains and the, um, the Great Dividing Range um, to the south. Uh, and some of the areas, maybe this is good news for some of the areas at the north, they're, they're going to be at, at less risk in the future. So that's, um, that's short and sweet and finished. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, and if you can hang around for another 15 minutes until sure. after the presentation, we will sure have questions for you. Yep, I can do that.